Not my best. Good Friday morning, uh, backyard naturalist friends. It is now officially spring. Spring had sprung on Tuesday night at 10.06 p.m. Uh, that is when the sun was shining for 12 hours, no matter where you were on the planet. Uh, and now here in the Northern Hemisphere, the amount of sunlight is increasing uh, and the amount of nighttime hours is decreasing. And we're getting really close to the beginning of fall bird migration. Um, but what weather in Milwaukee likes to remind us that we are in Milwaukee, which is why I'm looking out of my window and seeing big chunks of snow falling from the trees. Um, it's why I didn't move my shovels to the basement, even after our recent 60 degree days. Um, and I love it. And maybe, maybe I'll just finally get some skiing in this weekend. Uh, who knows? Mm -hmm. I, it's been a rough, <laughs> it's been a rough, we, we did some sledding, but it's been it's been really rough for snow in Milwaukee and in Wisconsin and pretty much the world. Um, not all parts of the world, of course. Um, my name is Tim. I work at the Urban Ecology Center's research department. Uh, we study urban ecology, particularly urban wildlife, and that is usually often the focus of this weekly program. But today we're taking another detour from the norm. Um, we've already had a handful of episodes on water, the chemistry of water, water in the atmosphere, clouds and rain, the smell of rain, um, conservation. We have our in-house plastics expert, Menal, who's given, who's hosted several times. Um, and today we're going to be looking at the intersection between these two things, uh, because today is World Water Day. So happy World Water Day, everyone. Water absolutely deserves a day. Uh, and water deserves so much more. And in a few weeks, we're going to have a guest host that uh, will be looking at efforts to give water and other um, aspects of nature legal rights. Uh, so water is absolutely essential. Water needs our help and we need water. So today we're going to primarily look at the human concept of putting water into a petroleum-based container, a plastic container. We're going to look at the, the industry uh, bottled water, the effects, the history. Um, there's a lot of fantastic and sobering stories from this aspect of water conservation uh, and sustainability. And, and we'll look at these issues now together in episode 29 of season five, Not Without My Water. Could have been Not Without My Water bottle, um, but uh, that would have been too much work in an area of expertise I don't have to make in cover slide design. So sit back, relax, and enjoy. Uh, thank you for watching, whether you're here with us on Friday morning or watching this later. My recorded self is just as happy to be spending time with you in the future as my current self is here with you this morning. So with a nod to PBS, a big shout out to viewers like you. I'm honored that there is a group of folks that support this program by, by becoming part of the community of Backyard Naturalist subscribers. Uh, thank you so much for your financial support of this program. If you enjoy and uh, this this can be viewed for free and, and you have the desire and means, um, I encourage you to consider joining the, the wonderful community of subscribers. Uh, Amanda, Maggie, and I keep thinking of new ways to engage with you, uh, but to start as a subscriber, you never have to undertake that pesky process of registering for each program, you are automatically registered with your subscription. And through the magic of digital ones and zeros, a link comes to your device an hour before each program. And all you have to do is get comfortable and click on that link. We also have monthly subscriber field trips. Uh, last week's visit to the Blue Lotus was absolutely amazing. I appreciate all of you that went and also gave me your feedback. I'm passing that all on to Mike. Uh, they're doing such great work up there. Um, and have some very unique natural communities as, in addition to all the great work that they do um, for society. And it was really cool to hear the history of the place uh, from Mike Larson. So next month's field trip should also be fantastic. We're going to get a tour of Downer Woods with Allison Don Donnelly. Uh, she's a UWM professor who studies phenology and climate change and who gave a wonderful presentation to you all as a guest host a few weeks ago. Again, these trips are open to everyone, free to subscribers, and you can register on the UEC website 
You can also register on the UEC website for a program taking place tomorrow, which is a screening of the documentary Kiss the Ground, uh, taking place at Riverside Park at 12.30 p.m. if you're looking for something to do. Uh, narrated and featuring Woody Harrelson, Kiss the Ground is an inspiring and groundbreaking film that reveals the first viable solution to our climate crisis. By regenerating the world's soils, we can completely and rapidly stabilize the Earth's climate restore lost ecosystems, and create abundant food supplies. The film artfully illustrates how by drawing down atmospheric carbon, soil is the missing piece of the climate puzzle. Uh, we continue to prepare for and market our next eco-travel trip to Costa Rica at the end of the summer. This particular trip will be an accessible opportunity for folks who might need accommodations as we partner with Il Viaggio, a local ground on the ground operator that specializes on the creation of tailor-made travel experiences. And I'm super excited uh, to mention again, the next iteration of a more in-depth backyard naturalist experience with a yet to be named college level summer course. Uh, join us to discover a variety of terrestrial and aquatic habitats where we'll observe patterns learn about natural history and discuss ecological and evolutionary questions. Over six summer sessions, we'll explore our parks, tap into our creativity and connect with nature and each other. Uh, this course is designed to sit at the intersection of science and humanities. While we'll learn a lot about ecology, there will also be elements of art and mindfulness journaling that we will encourage you to pursue and all are welcome. And Backyard Naturalist subscribers get a nice discount on the course fee. So the idea for this episode came from a partner, but a lot of the material came from the media conglomerate of how stuff works and stuff you should know. Uh, actually, you know, I, I keep talking about how they're linked. I think they're somewhat linked. I, at least they were early on. I think the podcast now is linked to iHeartRadio, which has a lot of great podcasts. Um, but either way, uh, uh, in addition to the stuff you should know that came out of this group, um, I really enjoy the websites, the daily emails and the videos and all of the other fantastic information they provide. I'm, I'm on these sites quite frequently. And then finally, we've all probably heard by now of the very exciting upcoming total solar eclipse um, and how close the path of totality is to a whole lot of people in the United States. Uh, you really should go check it out if you have the opportunity on April 8th. You don't have to travel too far. Uh, but there is another kind of eclipse happening very soon, a much less drastic one, uh, but a cool one nonetheless. There will be a lunar eclipse on March 25th, but it's not a total lunar eclipse. Uh, we'll experience what's called a prenumbral lunar eclipse. And what that means is, well, yeah, is uh, if... If you, if you think about the relationship between the sun, the moon, and the earth, the sun is much bigger than the moon and the earth, so the, the sun's rays come from all directions. There's a, a tiny cone, of a, a shadow cone behind the earth or the moon, and if, if, if the earth blocks the moon, you get a total lunar eclipse if it's in that little cone, and vice versa, what's going to happen, uh, you know, again in a few weeks is that the earth is going to get entirely in that little cone of the moon. Um, so it's going to completely block out the sun from our perspective. Um, this is a much less sexy uh, type of eclipse. It's, it's much fainter. Most people barely notice it, but uh, there are areas to either side of that cone where not all of the sunlight reaches. Um, but, you know, because there's so much light coming from the sun, it'd be like, you know, taking a big fire hose and, you know, putting a couple fingers, there's that much less light coming. But astronomers care. It's kind of fun. If you do have a telescope or, or more importantly for me, if you know a friend who knows about these kinds of things, they could you could probably notice what's happening. But I think for most of us, um, we're not going to notice about. So kind of cool from a nerdy perspective, but but not from a like, wow, this is amazing visual perspective. OK. Uh, we're here to talk about water because it is World Water Day. So this is so happy. Happy World Water Day, everybody. Always happens on March 22nd. Started in 1993 by the UN 
um, and it's it's it was started to advocate for the sustainable management of freshwater resources. Every year has a theme, and this year's theme is water for peace. Uh, I think it's an apt theme. So you know, water is is such a precious resource that uh, it can spark conflict. It can create peace or it can spark conflict. And when it becomes scarce or polluted, or particularly when people have unequal access or no access to water, that's when tensions can rise uh, between communities, between countries. And the intention of World Water Day is to inspire people around the world to learn more about water-related issues and to take action to make a difference. So uh, that that is one of the reasons why we, I decided to, to look at a particular aspect of water. Um, it's a human right to access clean water and sanitation. And this topic just keeps coming up in our lives. And it's something I wanted to learn more about it, learn more about. Um, and that is our propensity to put water in bottles for drinking. And I would assume that after all of the back and forth in the media about the benefits and costs of bottling water, um, mainly the cost to the planet, but also to ourselves, that the use of bottled water would be on the decline or at least slowing down. Uh, I was mostly wrong. Um, so not entirely wrong. You, you do see that tiny dip, uh, but this graph shows bottled water consumption per individual in the United States between 1999 and 2022, 2022, two years ago. So in 1999, when we were all worried about Y2K, the average person in the United States uh, drank over 15 gallons of bottled water per year, which meant that the entire United States was drinking four, about 4 billion gallons of bottled water per year. Just two years ago in 2022, at the end of this graph, we are at about 46 gallons of water per person. That's more than a threefold increase. And that's average. So these statistics include everyone. Uh, there's there's some people that are way, way, way higher and a lot of people that are way lower. I mean, this, this includes babies. Um, it includes people that refuse to drink bottled water. Uh, and the country itself went from drinking 4 billion gallons of bottled water per year to 16 billion gallons. That's a lot. 12 billion gallons more, a uh, fourfold increase. Um, that's incredible. And and I really just hope that that little downward blip is a sign of, of falling use. Um, because by far the biggest form of bottled water comes in single-use plastics. The single-use plastic water bottle. This this tiny bottle here before polluting the beach probably gave someone about five sips of water. Uh, you may hear disdain in my voice today. I will try not to get too soapboxy. Um, and I do need to say first off that I completely understand there are situations where water bottles are literally the difference between life and death um, or poisoning yourself. And I, I absolutely do not discount that life-saving side of bottled water. Um, I'm really talking about situations where it is a choice, um, but I will try to stick to facts and be as objective as possible. Um, but it's really not easy when you also see just the, the dark side of pollution and the dark side to your health. So surprisingly, um, humans have been bottling water at least since the 1700s and possibly even the 1600s. And, and you know, I'm not talking about you know, people have always been, humans have always been transporting water in like buckets and, and urns. Um, but I'm talking about actually bottling water. Um, and the earliest evidence is in England in 1622 at a holy well in Malvern. Um, and Malvern was, was like a spa town. It was a place to go and just like, you know, any spa, you relax, you rejuvenate, you refresh, you, you do mindfulness. Um, kind of an extension of the Roman bath. And uh, there was a spring that had been used for, you know, centuries. And um, and then at, at some point, they actually put a spigot. And this is the spigot. And uh, the water from this well was, you know, was people, people consumed it for what they thought were therapeutic properties. If you drank it, if you, if you bathed in it, um, it had, you know, it's, own unique blend of special minerals, like a remedy um, for many common ailments. 
uh, for a, a, you know, in a holy sense, it, it could could soothe you. And uh, someone had the idea that this amazing, special, unique water could be bottled and then enjoyed by people that weren't in this spa town. So it could be shipped, event, you know, starting off with being shipped to other parts of England, but then, you know, to other parts of Europe and, and so on. So such was the birth of the bottled water industry. The earliest bottles were, you know, clay, um, earthenware before moving to glass and then plastic. I I would certainly be much more inclined to buy bottled water from the store if it came in earthenware or ceramics. It's really cool. Um, but then I'd probably reuse it and it would just become my hip new water bottle. Um, but, you know, the, the, the earliest bottled water was advertised and distributed as an elixir from a very special Holy Springs. If you drink this water, it would heal you. And so they were looking for ways to transport this water beyond, um, you know, and, and, and make a profit, of course. Um, there is a lot of really cool history that I'm skipping over, uh, but we'll, we'll go to the 1800s in, in, you know, particularly in Europe and the U S uh, there was a brand of water that really took off, um, which is Perrier, a French company <clears throat> that bottled mineral water from a spring in Southern France. The spring itself was was called Les Bouillons or the Bubbles and had been used as a spa since the Roman times, uh, reportedly enjoyed by Hannibal himself in the year 218 BCE. Uh, later, the spring was bought by a local doctor, Louis Perrier, who began to operate it as a commercial spa and then also began bottling the water to sell. And now we're in 1898, so right around the turn of the century. Um, and then one of the main reasons that Perrier ultimately became so successful around the world was advertising marketing. So the, the very distinctively shaped green bottle that became instantly recognizable um, and they advertised in the most popular media. So this is Life magazine in the 1920s and they did very well. Uh, but then, you know, 20s, pretty much through most of the 20th century, um, it, you know, stayed popular, but then you have another major advertising push that a lot of us probably remember uh, in the in the 1970s and 80s. So Perrier really pushed itself as the drink. Um, you know, I hired Orson Welles, probably the most, you know, certainly most famous director of the time, maybe of all time. Um, and they were in People Magazine, uh, huge, huge marketing push, huge rebranding. And and Americans in particular uh, became pretty much obsessed with it. So it went it went from becoming an elixir for the health conscious to really kind of a status symbol. In addition to that health conscious. So if you're drinking Perrier, not only are you health conscious, but you're elite. You're you know anything French is is uh, this this ad says it's uh, that Perrier has added je ne sais quoi. So it, it, that association with you know highfalutin behavior. Um, and uh, it became, you know, kind of a cool thing to do. And and again, people would drink it for um, the health purposes too. Of course, there were other bottled beverages that also started out as health elixirs and became very popular. Um, and so these other companies saw this new craze as a threat, the threat to their bottom line. It's, it's an alternative to the healthy soda, uh, but it's also pretty hard to argue to tell people they shouldn't be drinking water. Um, so it was going to be a losing battle and, and pretty soon Pepsi decides to throw their hat in the ring and they develop a new brand of water to start to compete with Perrier <clears throat> and they start the Aquafina brand with its perfect taste. Coca-Cola was kind of dragging their feet. They weren't ready to, to jump into the bottled water industry, so to speak. Um, but eventually they, they realized it, you know, they'd be losing out on a lot if they didn't. So they developed the Dasani brand of water. And that was late in the game, 1999, with its clean, fresh taste um, and no explanation of why it's called Dasani. Um, but really then when Coke also gets into it and you have all these products, that is the beginning of the, the graph we saw at the beginning. 1999 is just, you start to see this huge growth in bottled water uh, in the US and around the world. 
and this growth resulted in a frenzy of consolidation. So you have so many stories, um, almost as if they're airlines. Uh, so many stories where you have this, this uh, you know, old bottled water company that was regional, uh, is bought out by the mega companies of today. So Arrowhead and Poland Spring and and um, uh, Deer Park. Sorry. Um, they all came from, you know, these are all bottled water you can now get in 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 your local gas station or, or grocery store. These are very common, but they all had their roots um, from these local, you know, they're all in the 1800s. So they're all pretty old regional bottled water industry. Um, but then it just became so popular and so profitable that you just had this mass buying of of these companies into the massive industry it is today. So by the year 2000, it's on. Um, and bottled water is becoming uh, not only a thing, it's becoming the most consumed beverage in the United States. There are more people drinking bottled water than coffee, which is a shocker as I sip my morning coffee. And um, more people are drinking bottled water than beer or Coca-Cola or anything else. Uh, even though, as we'll soon learn, learn a lot of the bottled water you buy is municipal tap water, which in some ways makes sense because the earliest bottled water came from springs and the springs were the municipal tap water source of their time. But now companies are making a killing by tapping into the city tap waters or to the city municipal water, um, tap water, and selling them, you know, what probably cost them pennies for several bucks a pop. So really good for the bottom line, terrible for the planet. Um, so now you have so many people drinking bottled water, uh, which, you know, oops, causes pollution. Um, but ironically, many people are drinking bottled water because there is this sense that, well, the rest of the water is already polluted. So might as well drink bottled water because people think it's cleaner and pure and healthier. Um, and then you start to get this kind of disconnect of, uh, it kind of between it's, it's almost like tribalism. You get a, you get, you get two sides that are judging each other that the people who drink tap water, who probably get a little, you know, sanctimonious and say, why are you drinking water? That's killing the planet and is so expensive. And then you get the people drinking bottled water who probably look down at the tap water drinkers with disdain thinking, okay, you know, go ahead and drink that toxic sludge if you want to. It's not quite as bad as the middle school fights between the kids who like Duran Duran and the kids who like Michael Jackson. At least this is for, for those of you born in the seventies know this for sure. Um, this is also probably a good time to interject that. Like I said, in the beginning, there are areas in the world and in the U S where drinking water has become an absolutely terrible political issue. So certainly Flint, Michigan is the most popular. It's received the most attention, um, but many other places that haven't received the attention here in Milwaukee, the lead pipes have caused major trauma um, in places all around the world. Access to drinking water is severely limited due to pollution or armed conflict. Um, so in the short term, I do have to mention bottled water can be an absolute lifesaver. Um, and I don't want to diminish the severity of the problem at all. Um, for many Americans, however, tap water is is likely the safest, likely the most effective and most economical, certainly, way to hydrate. So there have been, you can search the internet. There's a lot of people that have done blind taste tests. Um, tap water consistently is is uh, the same or, or, you know, you can't tell the difference or sometimes tastes better than bottled water. It's ridiculously cheap. Um you know, particularly compared to what you'd, you'd pay for the same amount of bottled water. Um, and it's regional. The, the The source of your tap water is going to be different. Uh, Carolyn's in Florida. I bet the, the water down there, you know, sometimes people say, I'm, I'm not disparaging Florida, but there's places in Florida where say, you know, the, the tap water tastes like rotten eggs because not because it, you know, it's poisonous or anything. It's just, it has a high sulfur content. Perfectly safe to drink. Um, but, you know, tastes like sulfur and not a lot of people want to drink things that taste like sulfur or bathe in things, you know, in, in water that smells like sulfur. So it is regional. Um, the source of your tap water uh, is going to have its own distinct 
you know, when you travel, you, you sometimes notice um, uh, the difference in taste in the water. And it's not only the taste, it's also the local life form. So you, you've probably heard of or maybe experienced Montezuma's Revenge, uh, which is a name given to illnesses that you might get by going to a new era and drinking the local water source. The, the water source is safe. It just has a different makeup of, of uh, microscopic critters. So um, you, you introduce the, the new life forms into your gut and your gut's like, whoa, what's going on here? And you feel it and, and spend a little time in the bathroom. Um, of course, you know, you can, you can get around that by drinking beer or by drinking treated water. And uh, if you, if you want to take everything out of the water and literally only drink hydrogen and oxygen, um, you can drink, you can drink water that's treated through reverse osmosis. Um, it literally takes everything out of the water, even the, the, the beneficial things like, you know, magnesium, potassium, calcium, um, there are other micronutrients and minerals that are good for your body that are found in water. Um, when bottled waters tap into municipal water, they usually filter it like this. So they they take the municipal water and just purify the crap out of it. And, and then they have, you know, quite a bit of leeway about how they're going to advertise it. Uh, and, and this has caused some, you know, some political and community bickering for for people paying attention. So Alaska water uh, is marketed as premium glacial water from the last unpolluted frontier. And it turns out that it's actually, I think it was, I don't think it's around anymore. It was Juneau, Alaska's municipal tap water collected and purified. So it is pure. It is absolutely pure because, but you know, after that reverse osmosis process, it's basically the same thing as if you would have taken it from Lake Michigan. Um, and I guess you could argue that Juno's municipal water comes from glaciers, uh, you know, but Alaska water then took that glacial water, which that, you know, sounds cool, and then took everything out of it, but marketed it, you know. So when in, you're in the store, you you see the marketing and that's, that's what it, it draws your attention, even though, like I said, chemically you're drinking just water there's nothing special about that water and i guess if you just want purified water then that's fine um and so there's the same same with a company called glacial clear water and there's absolutely nothing glacial about this water it's actually sourced from the municipal tap water of greenville tennessee by the dairy farmers of america which is based in kansas city missouri so you know, I, I could be wrong with my geography, but I'm I'm pretty sure there aren't any glaciers near Missouri or Tennessee. So, but this, you know, this demonstrates that bottled water companies have quite a bit of leeway in how they advertise. Um, you know, I guess you could argue that the groundwater in Tennessee was once glacial during the ice age. Um, but there there can be pushback from the community or the FDA, and 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 so you do see that uh struggle. Um Bottled water is overseen by the FDA. And one of the legal requirements that you do have to do is, is you have to put on the label the source of the water, not the location. So they don't have to say that this water is from Tennessee, um, but they do have to say the source of the water. In this case, the source is that it's purified. Um, so you, if you read the fine print, you know, you can figure out if it's purified from a major source, but you, they usually leave out the specifics. They, they're going to do this in very broad strokes as, you know, as much as they can, obviously, because they want to sell as much of this product as they can. Um, so if you read on your label, if you read on your label that your water is artesian, um, all that means is that the water came from an artesian well. Uh, it doesn't mean it's, you know, it doesn't say where the artesian well is. Uh, it it could be Alaska, it could be Indiana, um, but it if it says artesian, it has to come from an artesian spring, and an artesian spring is simply uh, an artesian well, or comes from an artesian well. I'm sorry, it, the the spring comes from a confined aquifer of porous rock, clay, and or sand. And so what happens is you have pressure that forces that water to the surface. That is what an artesian well is. So if you put 
artesian on your label, it does have to come from that specific type of well. Um, and then that's all, all that you need to know about it. If something is labeled mineral water, um, that means it comes from a spring and has a higher content of total dissolved solids than pure water. So, you know, they don't have to say what the solids are, but usually there's, you know, the, the ones that we want. So like calcium, magnesium, potassium, salt, other, you know, those micronutrients. And specifically to be labeled mineral water, it has to have 250 parts per million of these total dissolved solids. Uh, mineral water itself can have a very distinctive taste, just like tap water. Um, our family was just in the Dells and and the water that came to our table was was obviously mineral water. You could you could taste the salt. Uh, it was good. And, and um, it's not salt water, but you could taste the salt in it. And uh, this slide also brings up another designation. So this is, this is, these are both mineral water, um, but you also have to label whether it's sparkling water or not. Um, so in this case, there's both mineral water, one is sparkling, one isn't. Um, some natural springs, produce naturally carbonated water. So when it comes out of the earth, it's already fizzy. There's no carbonation process that happens afterwards. Um, the, the best example is if, if you have a spring near a volcano, um, the heated rock around an aquifer uh, will turn the carbon into a gas and it kind of naturally infuses carbonation into the water. It is really difficult to get naturally carbonated water from the spring to your table. Uh, there, there are companies that do this, but it's much more expensive to get naturally sparkling water. Uh, what most companies do is that they take the water, they decarbonate it, and then they recarbonate it just before bottling through artificial processes. Um, but if they're going to call it this, they have to legally carbonate it back to the same level it was from the spring in which, from which they got it. Um, so most of the popular brand, brands like San Pellegrino, um, and Topo Chico are artificially carbonated in this way. Um, and then you have water that's just labeled purified. Um, and this is where like probably the cheapest, the most read readily water, the water you can get everywhere, the Dasanis, the Aquafinas, the, you know, the Walmarts, um, the, all of those brands that are just everywhere. And again, it's almost always the in the case that for these big ones, it's municipal tap water that's purified, uh, usually through reverse osmosis, sometimes through distillation, um, ozone purification, which uses oxygen and electricity, sometimes UV light or some combination of these filters. But in this case, the source of the water doesn't matter. Um, you just mark it and brand it as purified water. Um, you don't even have to mention on your label if the source comes from non-potable water. So, you know, it could have been water from your bathtub or or the puddles in your street because the reverse osmosis process turns it into pure water. Um, e even salt water, you can do that with reverse osmosis, but that's very expensive. If water comes from a spring, then is des designated spring water. Uh, so the, the difference between a spring is that the water is already at the surface. You're not tapping down into it. Um, it, it can be taken direct from the surface um, and bottled. It can be accessed through a, a drill. You can drill to it as long as it has the same company, com composition as the source. Um, and this has to be obviously a sanitary and protected environment. Um, but this would be the type of water that, you know, you could scoop in your hand, drink right from the source. There aren't a whole lot of places that I've been able to do this. Just fill your water bottle right from the source. But when you do, it, it can be really cool. So, um, if it's a source spring water and it maintains its purity, uh, you can, you can label it as spring water tapping into your, your early human self. Um, and then the final designation is well water. And that's pretty simple. It's just water that comes from a well, which means you're tapping down into the groundwater instead of the groundwater coming to you through a spring. Um, I always thought it was strange if I'd go to a house and ask somebody if the water was safe to drink and they'd say, oh yeah, it's well water. Because in my mind, 
this is the type of well I think of immediately. It's like the old, you know, the one you hear about in stories with the bucket. Um, but for the most part, it's it's really this system, which is a lot less mystical, but also cool to see and visualize and be like, oh, okay, this makes a lot more sense um, than the bucket in the back with the well. The water that we drink is regulated by two agencies. If it comes from your tap, it's regulated by the EPA, the Environmental Protection Agency. Uh, if it's water in bottles, it's regulated by the FDA or the Food and Drug Administration, which uh, is interesting to me in several ways. So uh, bottled water is categorized as packaged food, which is why it's the FDA that's in charge. This is why bottled water has nutrition information stickers on it, um, which seems a little strange. Even stranger, bottled water has an expiration date. For the most part, the FDA is very lax in its rules and regulations and enforcement around bottled water because it terms it a low risk food. Um, in fact, when people drink bottled water because they think it's healthier, the FDA standards for most things we don't want to have in our water has a much higher acceptable limit than the APA puts on our tapped water. So your bottled water by law can have higher amounts of coliform bacteria or poop essentially. Um, it can have higher acceptable amounts of life in it, viruses and bacteria. Uh, it can have higher amounts of radon. Your tap water is held to a much stricter limit on all these things, and it's tested much more regularly. It's the much more strict enforcement. Um, the only thing that your bottled water must legally have lower limits on is lead. Um, the FDA is really strict on lead, whereas you know tap water, it, it often, like I said, goes through these old leaded pipes. It'd probably be really, really hard. Um, it, you know. It, hopefully still working towards it. Um, but your tap water has much higher acceptable limits of lead. Uh, but just, you know, in just about every case, your tap water is kept to much higher standards um, than what's in allowed in your, in your bottled water. So it, you know, know the situation in your own house. Uh, lead is something that you can filter out. You want to just make sure that you know that it's there so you can treat it because you don't want to be drinking it. Um, as I mentioned very there's not a lot of testing not a lot of regulation around bottled water it according to the fda it must come from an approved source and that source could be a well a spring municipal water but by law you do have to say what the source is you know among those groups and the source occasionally has to be tested um and then you have to put the label you have to put on the label anything you add to the water because fluoride is often added to city water, the the only reason bottled water would have fluoride is if the company specifically added it. So, you know, that's where the American Dental Association probably has, you know, a strong say in encouraging you not to only drink um, bottled water. And, and there's other reasons too, all those micronutrients I was mentioning. But, um, and, and, you know, I, I, I don't want to take a side here, fluoridated water, depending on who you talk to, is still kind of a debated debated topic. Um, but it's, it's often in, in your tap water. Uh, another important thing to note is that if a bottled water company is all in one state, um, so the source of the water is in the state, the processing happens in the state. It's only distributed in that state. It, no parts of it ever go outside of state. Then the FDA is not involved and that, and then state regulations are the only thing. And it's important to know that there's a, a several states that do not regulate bottled water at all. So there's absolutely no oversight. Um, and you're basically, basically trusting that you're drinking what the company says you're drinking. Um, so I guess that, that probably gets into your, you know, how much do you trust your fellow humans and, and corporations at that point, you know, and, and maybe it's a, a small neighborhood farmer's market type of operation. Um, but there are states where bottled water, if in this certain cases, there's no regulation. But in general, there's not a lot of regulation in bottled water in general. Um, and like I said, your tap water is much more strictly regulated um, than the bottled water. So uh, oversight or not oversight, um, you know, I mentioned what's in the water and what's regulated in the water, but that's 
just part of it. The, the rest of it is the packaging. So if you have earthenware packaging or glass packaging, there's probably not too much to worry about. Uh, but if it's plastic, there's a lot to worry about. Um, the, because the chemicals in the plastic container do leach into the water. So you have microplastics of, of polycarbonates, of PVCs, polystyrenes, leach from the water bottle to the water, and then you ingest those microplastics. This gets worse over time and with heat. So, you know, if you find some three-year-old plastic water bottles that were up in your attic where it gets really hot, you can imagine there's a lot of plastic in that water. And if you think, well, I'll just buy a single use plastic bottle and refill it over and over, that is certainly better for the environment. But the longer you use that water bottle, the more plastic you will continue to consume. So there was a, a study in 2018 that looked at 259 brands of bottled water in 11 countries. And they found that 93% of them contain microplastics. And more often than not, a substantial amount of microplastics. So on average, each bottle had 325 pieces of plastic per liter. Um, and a, one bottle of Nestle Pure Life had 10,000 parts per liter. And these plastics are endocrine disruptors, uh, they're obesogens, and you're, you're putting them in your body, potentially very bad for your body. Uh, the problem is the, the plastic companies will go out of their way to say there is no definitive proof of this yet, of, of the impact on your body. Um, but it's hard to imagine this proof is not coming soon, so why would you risk uh, continuing to poison yourself. Um, this, this of course, just deals with the plastics that enter your body, um, you know, and become part of your flesh and says nothing of the problem um, outside of your body. Uh, so, you know, this, this, this has been covered uh, other times in this program. And, um, you know, Menal is an amazing source of of the, the problems with plastics in the environment. Um, there, you know, it, there have been some improvements in, in, you know, trends towards improving the issue with plastics in the environment. So in 2005, we were effectively recycling about 10% of our single use plastic bottles. In 2020, 15 years later, that number is up to 30%. So I guess that's a good thing, but that also means that 70% of this rapidly growing industry, uh, the bottles are not being recycled. And then you have, you know, Norway is doing a much better job. You know, 97% of their plastics are recycled. Recycling is, is expensive. Um, for a lot of countries, they would pay China to ship their plastics to, you know, to be recycled in China, but it's, uh, it's becoming much more expensive and China is beginning to stop this process as well. Um, you know, so that's, that's the, the other dark side of the plastic industry. Um, there are people, you know, working, oops, on changing the industry. Um, there are now corn-based compostable plastics. Um, there's a couple of problems with this. First of all, it's only compostable if you actually compost them, uh, which most people don't. And so you still have all the rest of the problems. And the other potential major problem is that you cannot add corn-based plastics to re regular recycling. It probably, it, you know, it seems like, oh, this is, this is not plastic. You know, it's, it, it's, it's, uh, it's corn-based. It's, it should be fine. It actually mucks up the plastic recycling system. And when that happens, like huge amounts of plastics have to be thrown away completely, even some that would have been recycled. So it's a it's a good step, but it can be a potentially, you know, dangerous band-aid because we actually could be making the system worse if we're not disposing of them the right way. And I would imagine most people, myself included, would just think of throwing these corn-based plastics into um, the recycling or, you know, or if, if you don't have a composting system, you know, I guess it just probably goes into the garbage. A much better alternative remaining um, to us is the, you know, the old school glass bottles, of course. Um, but then now there's companies that are marketing canned water and boxed water, which 
you know, likely are better. Um, I'm sure, you know, it's not completely cut and dry. There's, there's always kind of the pluses and minuses, but it seems like a much better alternative to plastics. And if you want to know what's in your tap water, there is the Environmental Working Group Tap Water Database that you can check out and enter your zip code. Um, there's also some good news from the uh, legislation front. There's there's more pressure being put on the producers of plastic bottles and the and the the ones that use plastic bottles in their in their products, because it, you know it's easy for them to say, hey, you know we're making the plastics. It's it's y'all that are throwing it away and doing things. But you know this, this so it's kind of like not my, you know. I'm not part of the problem because this is what I'm doing. Um, so there's been legislation introduced in three states, in Washington, in Maine, and Michigan, uh, that are designed to keep the producers accountable for all of the pollution and all the health issues that are that come with their product. So, um, you know, that's also a step in the right direction. Um, and and you'll also hear people say you know this idea that it takes so many years for plastics to break down. It'll compare it to other materials, but it's, it's a, it's a, a little bit of a misnomer, a little bit of a, you know, deflection because plastic never break down. They only break up into tinier and tinier pieces. So, you know, it might look like that plastic bottle is completely gone and dissolved, um, but it's still there. It's just, there's a million pieces of it now instead of one. Um, and then those tiny pieces are the ones that are making their way into our bodies, into the environment, the water, the source of our drinking water. So if you, you know, if you think of that bottled water versus tap water debate, at some point, we're all going to be drinking not bottled water, but we'll be drinking old water bottles because they're just making their way all into our drinking water, um, you know, one tiny piece of microplastic at a time. Uh, so... As, as much of a downer as this seems and is, um, it's just important, you know, I, I've spent my life drinking out of plastic water bottles and until I decided to to make the changes and, and you know, once I learned more. Uh, so that's why it's important to pay attention, to advocate, to inform, to pressure, to think about your choices, talk to your friends and family, because um, we're in this together and and everybody needs water. So thank you for joining me today um, and I will stop sharing my screen.